Um, so just some background on Census 2020. Um, so you might know that the US Constitution requires us to complete the census. And it, in fact, states very specifically that the census is required to count all persons living within uh, the United States. And that is regardless of citizenship. So we'll talk about that more as well, but um, a really important note there. So what does census actually do for us? Um, you'll hear oftentimes the big number, $800 billion gets appropriated via Congress by understanding who lives in each state, right? So very simply, $800 billion gets divided up amongst the states based on population size and then within the states based on the populations of each county. Um, and a lot of the federal, federally funded programs that you see listed here uh, are funded through census. And so when we think about Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Medicaid, excuse me, um, federal direct loans, um, SNAP or nutrition assistance programs, uh, federal grant programs for student loans, housing subsidies, all of these funded programs are impacted by the census. And you might also gather that they often are affecting uh, socioeconomic classes of high need, right? And so what does that mean to ensure that communities of color that tend to, in particular, be disproportionately of need for these programs be counted? That's kind of the first point. The next slide is to talk about, I think, three themes that I'd like you to take away from today. Uh, the first is undercounting. The second is underfunding, and the third is under resourcing. So Shamir is going to talk to us uh, a bit about and provide more context specifically about what undercounting looks like here in New York State. Um, but just so you're aware, if you're not already, there is already a move to have the census be completed online. And that, in and of itself, has great implications, particularly for communities that have challenges of connecting to the internet, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, undercounting historically has also been about low response rates. It's about understanding why households don't complete the census. This could be for a number of reasons. This could be for because of low education, this could be because of apathy, not really knowing why census matters, um, but could also be because of fear. And we're exploring all of those kinds of emotions when we think about uh, the impact of undercounting, and then what does it mean to like motivate someone to actually complete the census, knowing that those barriers exist. The second with respect to underfunding. So the administration has also um, done a number of uh, things to affect the fiscal funding of census. Um, decreasing the number of enumerators that go door to door. So one of the narratives is that we're moving online in order to save money. And because we're saving money, we should be able to also uh, use that money to invest in technology. And this technology is going to help get more people to complete the census, and so we don't need to fund people to go door to door in order to ensure that people get counted, right? Um, those decisions effectively uh, might continue to affect, the decisions around funding might continue to affect the counting piece as well. And then last but not least is the, is the under-resourcing. So when we say resources, uh, some of you have already approached me about how to volunteer. Um, you could actually apply to become an, an enumerator. Um, so we can talk about that when it comes to uh, the fact that about a half a million enumerators will be hired, less than what have been in the past. Uh, but there are jobs to become enumerators. And ideally, those people who go door to door are recognizable faces that um, are trusted messengers of, um, that can help community, communities or people in our community complete the census as well. The other thing about underfunding uh, and under-resourcing is that a lot of the ways in which uh, either the move to online has, will be rolled out, as well as this, the ways in which enumerators will be trained, 
as well as um, things like the citizenship question, a lot of these moves have not been tested. A lot of field testing that typically takes a long time to um, get results around have been abandoned. Um, and so there seems to be a number of tactics, uh, whether uh, in particular to suppress uh, the count, uh, particularly into 20, in 2020. So I think the last thing I'll say is um, framing the conversation for today to really open up a conversation. We really hope that this does engage you to ask questions of us, but maybe even spark some ideas about how to overcome these barriers. Uh, with me is the founder of Next Day Better, Ryan Latata. He's sitting up front. Um, and you'll see Next Day Better's logo uh, alongside this campaign called Why We Count. And I'll share more with you about that. But our intention is to motivate diaspora communities, in this case, the Puerto Rican diaspora, to be counted, as well as the Filipino diaspora. And so we want to have a conversation about, well, how do we actually motivate people? If we know it's important to complete the census, how do we actually motivate individuals, households, um, citizen and non-citizen of mixed documented status to overcome fear and use the census as a tool to take hold of their future, right? And so we'd love to get more of your feedback on that as well. Any additional thoughts before uh, I hand it over to you, Shamir? Or would you like to get going on your points? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so I'll do a deep dive and yeah. talk more about the hard to count communities in New York State, but also uh, bear in mind that that's mostly a reflection of the rest of the nation. Um, I, I have a couple of slides that the first um, shows a really great tool that we've used in our report. So last fall, the Fiscal Policy Institute did a survey of over 30 community-based organizations to see what their plans were for the 2020 census, as they are all the trusted community voices that have um, intimate relationships with the hard to count, which I'll explain in a second who they are. So we said, these are the groups that are already in the communities. These are our boots on the ground. How much money would they need to carry out the um, various plans that they have to engage their community members and um, encourage them to participate in the 2020 census. And so from our research, um, which looked at those, those plans and also the populations of um, hard to count communities throughout all 62 counties in New York State, we said that um, the governor and legislators should allocate $40 million just for CBOs. And um, as a comparison, California has allocated over $100 million to their census outreach efforts. And that includes multiple buckets, not just funding for CBOs, that's funding for their own state campaign to um, encourage their population to participate in the, in the census. So um, the map that you see up there now comes from a, web, a website called Hard to Count 2020, HTC 2020. And um, the census conducts the 2020 census survey, or the census survey, and afterwards they, they sort of um, do a self-reflection of how well they've done. And they can tell us exactly um, which populations are hard to count. And these include uh, African Americans, um, immigrants, people with uh, limited English speaking ability, children under five are some of the, among the highest hard to count population. Um, yeah, these are residents in low income, urban, rural communities. Um, this year for the first time, because the census will be online, it's people without access to the internet, um, which is an alarming um, nearly 20% of the state's population does not have access to the in internet. Um, Native Americans, homeless, uh, numerous other uh, groups. And I guess, yeah, so the, the very short list of who is overcounted are non-Hispanic whites, 
um, which means that uh, they're the, I, I, I want to get this sentence right, I've been like, <laughs> they're the only racial group to be overcounted, uh, despite the net undercount being the lowest it's been in history. Um, so the difference in an overcount means that wealthier white communities get more of their share of resources, more of their share of um, representation, and not only state houses um, around the country, but also in Congress. Um, and that has, as we all have seen, uh, very real effects on everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Um, so yeah, going back to this map, um, you can see the red slash orange colors indicate where the non-response rate, which means that people did not mail back their, their census forms, which requires like really costly follow-up, um, is over, uh, it's, it's over like 10%. So the highest, the highest non-response rate comes from Kings County, Brooklyn, and they were at 33%. So 33% of people in, in Brooklyn did not mail back their census questionnaire forms the first time, and that's actually the highest in the whole country, fun fact. Um, so that's, that's where we were, that's 2010. Um, and you can, it's a very fun tool to like play around with. You can, you can learn more about not only uh, the counties, but like you can look at your own census tract, so your block. Or neighborhood and see um, how people are responding to the census there. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Yeah. This is the one with the details between Kings County and the Bronx. Okay, great. It's hard to see, I know. Yeah, I, so I have the same tables um, in front of me, but um, so here's Here's a great example. Everyone should know, I have a copy of, I have copies of the report that we wrote um, last fall, and you can see there also um, how these numbers translate into funding. So, um, like I said, 33% of households in Kings County did not mail back their 2010 questionnaire form. That's sort of like in the middle of the table. And you can see that in the Bronx, there is, um, you can look at the breakdown of their population. So 19% of the population is Hispanic, 35% African American, 13% Asian. 21% of um, households in the Bronx don't have access to the internet. And this is in 2010. This is, this is all data from the census, by the way. So we're all here up here talking about the census and everything that we know about how important it is comes from the census. So I can't imagine a future where we aren't able to talk about facts because you know there was such a an extreme um, undercount. Um, yeah, so 40% of um, the population in the Bronx are or in Brooklyn are immigrants. This is so critical when we're thinking about um, everyone being counted and the, sort of the, all the work that we have to do to get there. Um, this is, this is pre-Trump. This is pre-fear. This is pre-citizenship question. This is, um, yeah, all of that. And um, I guess, Personally, as a black woman doing this work, I, th I always think about where this all began. And the first undercount was with the first census. Um, as we all know, the census is mandated in the Constitution so that we can get a count of our population, so that we can um, apportion seats in Congress. That's like the number one reason why um, the founding fathers uh, decided that we needed a census. But in that very first census, we also, there was also um, the sort of compromise, the three-fifths compromise, mm -hmm. which said that African Americans were three-fifths of a person. So although there was a count, not everyone was counted equally. And um, that's, that's where, that's like the long legacy of um, the undercount in our population, in our country. Um, and so today we have a lot of work to do to make sure that everyone understands how important they are 
and that their information is also protected. I think they're, they're, there's a sort of double layer to that um, this time around because you know, we have fear of privacy, just like will the Census Bureau share my data with any other you know, group, whether that be um, the government or anyone, but then also um, Will it be protected? Like, <laughs> will will the Census Bureau be hacked? Right, because it's going to be online. So there, there's that. Um, those are those are yeah. some of my thoughts about the hard to count. Yeah, I think we have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I do. Let me see if it's in my notes. It's definitely maybe in that report. I mean, 1790? 1790. Not 60, yeah. <laughs> 1790. Yes. All right, this. Another question. Oh, there's a microphone. All right. Thank you. Are all the um, census uh, surveys going to be online or are some going to be mailed? Some of them will be mailed. And how many questions are on the census? Usually? I, I believe 10. Okay. Yeah, with this, so we'll talk about this more, but the citizenship question will not be on the census. Um, that would have made it 11, but it's a 10. So how do they determine what's mail, who gets mailed um, census and who gets to do it online? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not, I'm not fully sure about it, um, but I can follow up with you. There are a couple things. I, um, there are a few conversations that I've uh, participated in about the process and the window of time that households will have to respond. So April 1st of 2020 is the official launch date for census. It will start earlier in some more remote places and tribal lands. Uh, we know that, in fact, Alaska is the first place where census begins in January because of the fact that they are much more geographically dispersed. Um, April 1st, effectively, it's about six weeks that those who are able to and are ready to complete the census online will, will have to complete the census by the end of May. And if by June 1st you've not completed the census, there either one of two things can happen. Um, if you haven't if you're not a household that's already received a paper form, one will be mailed to you. And the second option is that an enumerator will come to knock on your door. Now that window of time is somewhere between June and the end of, uh, end of July, uh, if I have my dates correct. And so effectively the census period closes by August. It's a really short window of time for people to be ready to know what to do when uh, you know, depending on whatever mode they receive in their house. Yeah. So this is a challenge. Is this okay? uh, yeah, one more question. So you, I know you said that I think it was 30% of Kings County did not respond to the 2020. I'm curious how we have that data if they didn't respond. Like, wh where does that, where does that come from? Yeah, so um, it, it's a part of the Census Bureau's um, sort of like self-reflection that I talked about. They, it's a, it's a statistical analysis, so I cannot explain how they do it exactly. But they do release a report after um, every census count um, that goes and digs in deep and to say like, this is where we messed up and um, this is by how much as well. The, the non-response rates, you can, you can sort of begin to think about like the administration, administration data that we'll have on, on um, populations um, to be able to say X amount of people didn't respond. Oh, is there another question? Oh, two more questions. Yeah, one over here. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So I know there's, there's an effort uh, that's been going on this summer also to ensure that full addresses are made available. And so there's, there is an exercise through the US Census Bureau to confirm 
which households are households and that all addresses are available. And then the question is, who is in the home, right, specifically? Uh, when you think about renters and the turnover of the renter community in particular, without a completed form, you just, you don't know who lives there. Um, so yeah, that's the challenge for sure. Yes. Um, how are people notified on the internet that they're gonna receive this census um, documentation? Is it via email or do they get a letter and then they have to go on the internet and does it have to be in a home computer? Can they go to the library? Just trying to think of how to circumvent yeah. not responding. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question that actually I think lies on the shoulders of community-based organizations, as well as organizations like Next Day Better who are working alongside the um, what's called the uh, Census Hub, uh, led by the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights. And so there are working groups throughout the country nationally, as well as at the state level and locally, there are what are called complete count commissions who are uh, being funded uh, and I want you to talk about this, Shamir, about how funding is getting to New York State community-based organizations. Um, but it is, it is left to the advocacy organizations to get the word out. So you wanna talk more about that? Sure. Yeah, so people will definitely be going to libraries. Um, I'm a part of a, a statewide coalition called New York Counts 2020, and libraries are a huge part of that, that group. Um, so people will be able to go there as a resource to um, log, log in and, and fill out the census and have access to the internet, which is the most important. Well, a computer and the internet. Um, so I guess going back to funding. Yeah. Um, so we wrote this report in, in uh, the fall of last year after conducting the survey, and then we went around, went around the state rallying with Jorge and many other folks saying, we need, we need funding for this in the budget. And um, this is why. So we were with the community-based organizations and faith groups, uh, churches, um, mosques, everything, everyone really, um, saying, here's what we need to conduct um, door-to-door -door canvassing, community forums just like this, where we're talking about how important the census is um, and why everyone should mail back their forms or fill it out online. And in the end, Governor Cuomo allocated 20 million in the state budget to the census, outreach efforts. And um, he also set up a commission to uh, sort of investigate what, what's happening around the state around the census and how much groups would need. So unfortunately, um, they haven't, the commission hasn't released their report yet, but it would, it's, and it's not really clear how that money will be distributed, like how much of that will go to CBOs. Um, but there's 20 million in the state budget and that's a win. Um, the second part of, of resources and, and funding is New York City. And uh, half of the hard to count population in New York State lives in New York City. So, um, Thankfully, the city council and mayor have allocated um, 26 million to the census. And we know that I think um, around 15 million will be going to community-based organizations, which is also a win. So in, in total, we have about 46 million um, throughout the state going to census outreach efforts. And that's, that's actually really exciting. It's a step in the right direction. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure that many states, well, it'd be, it'd be better if more states were, were this proactive. At this point, we're all behind the game if we haven't allocated money and budgets yet. But um, there's still time and we can do this. <laughs> um. I'd like to, if there aren't any questions right now, just to invite Jonathan into the conversation as well to talk about the role of faith communities in helping to get out the count. And so one of the, uh, just to 
point specifically also to the county of the Bronx. Uh, Jonathan, if you could speak to kind of what, what are you hearing about the census? Uh, are there conversations about it? And what is your view about what we might be able to do? Well, thank you very much, uh, Jorge and Shamir, uh, for outlining, I think, very clearly uh, what is really at stake and thinking about what really is the moral imperative driving uh, the need to talk about census in a way that is engaging. And one of the things we're seeing is democracy uh, more and more perilously is reflecting less of ourselves uh, so that we look at democracy and we don't see ourselves to the extent that we're oppressed. Uh, so whether it's a per certain part of our identity um, that this country or this nation um, doesn't necessarily want to include, we do not see ourselves reflected from it. And what has happened is with the citizenship question um, as a, a weaponized attempt from the administration, um, the executive branch um, of our government, um, trying bit by bit uh, time by time uh, to see ourselves less reflected from this democracy. And how do faith communities and organizations working with faith communities view their own responsibility in relation to this erasure of not only identities and voices, uh, but particularly those that we're seeing are uh, from diasporic communities. Um, we're seeing this, uh, there's an all, uh, all out assault it feels on many Latinx communities, um, whether it is through the organic churning of violent rhetoric that is literally erasing lives, or the uh, colonization of an island where I'm from, where we do not have representation, um, even though we do pay federal taxes, even though uh, we do participate in an economy that doesn't give to us, and what does the census mean for diasporic communities? So for example, in Puerto Rico, you have around 2.5 million um, people living on an island that could vote in the general election but doesn't vote in primaries. Um, what's another way of those voices being represented when we have a large diaspora, probably 4.5 million um, individuals that live throughout the United States? Um, how do those communities uh, view themselves as representing their interest as it relates to the federal government here? Um, how do we uh, have ourselves count? And I know that part of the efforts of, of Next Day is also thinking about Filipino communities and diasporic communities, as mentioned, um, I would think of a great term by Ryan, we're cousins in colonialism. Um, in the sense that colonization I think is a, a, a dynamic that faith communities are wrestling with more and more, understanding that really what colonization is, is trying to make you feel part of an alienated government uh, that doesn't respond to your needs and to the extent that you assimilate to it um, by adopting what the colonizer wants your identity to be, which is American pie, patriotic, let's make sure that no criticism um, against uh, this ideal um, is, is supported. Uh, so that even as someone in the census, when I look at how I'm representing myself and I look at the ethnicity and the race and I identify as a, a non-white or a white Hispanic American, I mean, the, the, the complexities are so nuanced and so challenging and it makes you want to disengage, frankly, from the process. Um, you would think that the census, because of its import, would generate uh, so much more enthusiasm, but in reality, the same way that there was a massive attempt to disengage the population four years ago, or three years ago, rather, in the general election, um, the census, that happens in a very different way. And as we see the obstructionism that's happening with uh, the move entirely online mirrors what happens, let's say, with voting laws, where you see in communities the shutting down of DMVs um, in populations that are primarily impacted, low income, uh, black and brown, in rural areas that don't have readily access to a DMV center, we see that 
being another tactic um, in the arsenal and the strategy of disenfranchising and erasing uh, the voices and the identities of individuals. So how do faith communities, whether it's here, uh, Middle Collegiate, whether it's the interfaith community here in New York City and throughout, I would say, the country, speak in clear moral terms about A, why it's important that we see ourselves reflected in the processes of our democracy, um, that is critically important. Allay some of the fears and the concerns um, that may arise um, from, you know, we're anxious about surveillance. I mean, we're entering into a society um, where we hear about facial recognition um, really uh, cementing control over you by social networks who are unaccountable um, to any government because of lack of regulation. It is a... A, a like a cacophony of, of, of frustration and, and cynicism and why is it that it matters that we count um, and I think being able to frame for example the importance of what this looks like and the work that FPI Fiscal Policy Institute has done to show that at least in New York City why is it that Bronx communities are not participating in these different census outreaches from 2010. What are the trends? What are the shifts in populations? And how can we as faith communities um, begin to say, you know what? Maybe we do what Middle Collegiate is doing today and have at least 100 houses of worship in New York, in the Bronx, let's say, dedicate a weekend of faith um, in the kickoff in April uh, to speaking about census work and viewing civic engagement as an important element of why and how we serve our neighbors. Um, because if we in many communities feel that democracy is fair specifically to me, um, right? We say we want a fair democracy, um, but you cannot have fairness for the individual if there's not justice for all people. They walk hand in hand. Uh, so that's a relationship between fairness and justice. Uh, so that if my population, my sliver of my identity receives the resources that we need, there's a moral argument that needs to be made that that's good that it's fair to you, but justice for all looks like this. And it looks like ensuring that every community, in spite of where you're located, either geographically or what your ethnicity is, that you are represented and counted here. Because this form of colonialism, um, which is this uh, like fracture, of one's identity to the government and to one's fellow neighbor in society. And I even have trouble now speaking about our citizen duty because we've seen how citizenship has been weaponized as a tool of exclusion, even here as well. Uh, so when we think about the census as an important tool because it doesn't necessarily use the citizenship category, but rather it's really thinking about how do we give democratic access um, to the resources of our society? Because if you're a human being, just by virtue of existing here, um, there is a moral imperative that supersedes what the administration in this day and age believes as someone who should be conferred benefits um, as a, a citizen, um, as opposed to someone that's living here. Our, um, our non-documented communities um, have much concern about the census. Uh, prior to uh, being at Union Theological Seminary, um, used to work for the city, and a lot of the conversations around democratic and civic engagement centered on how do we make and how do we have communities that are not document feel comfortable? Um, can we guarantee uh, that they're not going to be surveilled? Um, that was a big question around um, what is called IDNYC, uh, which is New York City's ID. Um, and a lot of uh, communities were fearful of engaging in that process. And there were lawsuits by, no surprise, uh, Republican state lawmakers that wanted to give the federal government access um, to that data that was being collected by the city. So it's a tightrope. Um, it is a conflict between pushing individuals to take a civic action like enrolling and making sure that one is counted in the census, but at the same time, allaying those fears 
And how do we speak to communities in a way that we're not recolonizing? Uh, because oftentimes a lot of community organizations or a lot of groups in order to receive the funding um, uh, to do this type of work um, don't think carefully or with nuance. And that's part of the problem with the nonprofit industrial complex that has a very close relationship uh, with obtaining resources without demonstrating nuanced, targeted impact. Um, that acknowledges the, 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 the different uh, instances of the community. So I think that is uh, key for us to uh, see the moral um, imperatives around why census work is important and how faith communities could definitely participate in this way. We have two questions up front. Um, you all are speaking so beautifully, thank you. Um, I'm just really struck by how close we came to having the citizen question be on this year's census and how that might be alter, were that to have been the case, how that would alter the work you're doing today and the work we're encouraging community-based organizations to do. Um, and hypothetically, it could be on the next survey, I mean the, the 2030 survey, um, as we encourage people to participate in the 2020 survey, is it a, I'm just curious if in your mind it's a setup that will inadvertently hurt folks once it, that's, if that citizen question succeeds in being on a future survey. Does, So, do you want to say something? So, um, I can speak to a couple points around that. First is we do think the damage has been done, right? That the fear has been stoked in that we have an administration that is gathering people up and essentially effectively wanting to target undocumented communities. So this is a really big question for an organization like the one Ryan and I are working on together to, to overcome that fear, right? Um, so we do think that the damage has been done. And so part of the question, you know, what I, what I really appreciate about both voices here is that Shamir is helping us understand the true cost of outreach, right? That it really requires every one of us to participate and mobilize and get comfortable about not just the importance of the civic duty, but the moral imperative that was what Jonathan is telling us, right? And how do we, how do we um, use this as a tool to, to take hold of our future? Um, the second, which I, I, I would need to learn more about also though, is that there is an executive order that was um, set or is being drafted that would uh, essentially set forward the citizenship question in the 2030 census. What that means in, you know, in logistical terms and how the U.S. Census Bureau would adopt that in the, in the next decennial, we don't know, but at least for now we know that it's not being included. There was another question here, yeah. Have you thought about reaching out to schools, especially in like Kings County in the South Bronx, that could host something like this for the parents, um, being that that's pretty much their lifeline to the rest of the community. Like the PTA is more, I guess, intimately involved with families um, and can provide some sort of guidance and resources, you know, about the consensus. Yeah. So, have you thought about doing something like this in schools? Yeah, so at least, uh, so I think there are many kind of voices here. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with, are you familiar with any school-centric um, initiatives? No, I'm, I'm not, uh, but I know that in Kings County they do have a complete count commission that's um, underway, and I'd be really curious to see if those groups are represented there because they, they are doing great work and um, are organizing, and I would hope that they would be a part of that conversation. So. I think the, the conversation where we can go to next that perhaps you all can help us inform too is how do we, how do we message and effectively target, right? So um, Jonathan also brought the idea of how do we motivate other um, houses of worship 
uh, to mobilize effectively a year from now or, or less than a year from now to have more of these conversations. Um, we do think technology is our friend, and so we are testing out some different story uh, approaches, one of which I'd like to share. Do we have the sound for the video, uh, Christina? Yeah, okay. So I'm about to show you uh, just a preview, actually, of a, of a, of a short one-minute video that we've created through Next Day Better to help mobilize the Puerto Rican diaspora. And as Christina pulls that up, just a few things that um, we have been thinking a lot about uh, happens to be that the U.S. Census Bureau is already taking st uh, a pulse on what the response rate might look like for the 2020 census, right? There have been a, a lot of field work to date, so we're we're here representing a lot of uh, some big efforts. Um, about 40% of people between the age of 18 to 34 just don't really feel like it, there's any value of responding, right? And so we have a real challenge, not just with older groups who may uh, be less comfortable also with completing the census online, but also with the younger generation that don't see the value. Um, one in four are also concerned about the confidentiality uh, as well, uh, and that's true amongst communities of color. Um, and then one in four are also concerned that the data will be used against them. Uh, and as much as we have in our laws protecting our data within the US Census Bureau and ensuring it doesn't get shared with any other agency, law enforcement or court systems or otherwise, um, there is historical precedence and I think a, a uh, generation of people that still uh, see moments in history like the Japanese internment camps uh, and how the US Census data was used to uh, round up those families, right? So this is not too far from our own uh, collective uh, memories, uh, as well as the level of trust with federal and state governments, right? So we have a, a, a high, uh, significant number of barriers to try and overcome, but the opportunity that we have collectively uh, trying to be more targeted is to think about communities like the Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, and so we have been really uh, motivated by what we're seeing as an awakening on the island and within the diaspora. And so let me share with you this uh, short video and then uh, get, get your thoughts on what you think about it. Oye, mis puertorriqueños, mis hermanas y hermanos, mi gente on the island in nuestra isla, el Boriquen, my New Yorkans and Boricuas across the land. This is why we count. Our numbers shape our future for building an island stronger than Hurricane Maria, for dignified jobs for mommy and papi, for the affordable health care that abuelo and abuela need, for our afro Taino ancestry, for love and livable communities, for the next generation. Contamos. We count. Take the Census 2020 pledge at whywecount.org. So. I, I wasn't expecting applause, but thank you. <laughs> um, so that's great that you, you feel so moved by, by this. This is just one example of what Next Day Better is looking to do as a result of a grant of which uh, Middle Church will in fact be a fiscal sponsor for. So we're excited to begin this work. Um, WhyWeCount.org uh, hasn't officially launched yet, so this is a preview of what's to come. But the conversation we're having is that we believe we have a crisis of imagination. Uh, we are challenged by helping our communities imagine what it means to be funded, right? The statistics are what they are. The Constitution gives us the ability to count in the way that it does, but how we um, change minds and move people to complete the census is a whole other challenge. And so we believe being this targeted and this focus is gonna help us um, get people to, to participate. Um, so I think in this next segment, uh, we're happy to open it up to more questions that you might have, as well as ideas 
we're on the uh, search for more creators uh, as well to help us produce more of these stories and fill what effectively is a what we call a data void. Uh, so that when we search for census, we start to see our own stories reflected uh, specifically. So, yeah. Questions? Yeah. Are undocumented or people with not, without papers, are they asked to fill in the census? Are they... Yes. So, so yes. Um, so is, it, is it in Spanish? In particular, in Brooklyn, we need. It Spanish. will be available in multiple languages, uh, as in particular, and online. Um, and in fact, we know of many agencies uh, through. So the, so the the U.S. Census Bureau initiated a fairly significant request for proposals to agencies across the nation, and so we are working alongside uh, agencies. Uh, that are translating uh, documents for training purposes, uh, as well as to help guide those that complete the census. Shamir mentioned that uh, libraries are going to be a, a particular value to um, for technical assistance purposes, and so those those centers will be will have some of those resources as well. Um, but we need a lot of volunteers, and we know that that's going to be a particular effort going into the spring. Does the census need to be done in English eventually, so it can be done in Spanish, and then does it need to be translated into Spanish before it is sent back? Or you can... I think the forms send... are available in, in multiple languages, yeah. So someone's yeah. going to read it in Spanish and Correct. count... Correct, correct. Okay, and are, um, are there people who can help people... Fill to out complete the census. the census. Yeah, so yeah. this is exactly a really, really important point. So two things that you'll hear from us more through the Social Justice Committee in particular. One is in the fall, there will be an open applications for enumerators. So for those of you that are interested, and a couple of you have come up to me already, um, you'll be able to apply to be paid by the U.S. Census Bureau Great. to do door-to-door -door outreach. In addition, all of our community-based organizations need volunteers to be mobilized. And so we're going to start conversations about what that looks like for the spring. But volunteers will be absolutely critical. Okay. I think there's another question behind you, Marta. Yeah. Oh, oh, Rob. Hey, Rob. <laughs> hey. What's going on at Poor's People Campaign, Rob? What are you, oh, what are you I mean, <laughs> this is uh, awesome to see. I feel like it's a low-grade anxiety on everyone's brain is the census, you know, that's coming. It's just so... It's wonderful to see this happening in this conversation, um, and it's not early, I guess. But uh, so my question is 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 on the messaging and also the politics of uh, the census and, and for organizing purposes. Uh, if if anyone has not heard of, uh, it's, and I really apologize if I miss this, but um, or any of this, Thomas Hofeller and the guy who uh, who's, who who. Uh, It'll treat you to treat your kids right, because his daughter took his data and gave it to the uh, ACLU and the Common Cause uh, that showed that the citizenship question was just directly a, a an attempt, a, a blatant attempt, to create a whiter uh, electorate and whiter uh, representation in government. So we know with the citizenship question and and historically with the citizenship, uh, uh, historically with the census has been a tool of uh, of racism, that it you know is fundamentally you know, first categories as Shamir mentioned are uh, not just white but it's white and slave are the two categories that really and that doesn't you know and that's what it means to be a citizen in this country at the beginning and that you know um, so and it and what so my question is really about especially around the Latino uh, issue uh, and the 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 kind of uh, acrobats that are going around. Um, and have been played on with this group since you know 1850, of uh, you know officially called white uh, and never treated as such. Mm -hmm. So is it a race or is it ethnicity? And the, the answer is we don't know. I think it's a race when we're talking about brown people coming across the border, and then on the census we come as ethnicity. So much so that El Paso is 93% white. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to El Paso, 93% white and 81% Hispanic. Yeah. And so how do we engage that as far as this, because people are being polled, because the Trumpists can't 
or even just the extremist right wing, no, they can't win without pulling white people out of Hispanic right. into coalition. Um, and so what, how do we incorporate some of that into um, you know, the political organizing? And this might not be, this isn't for the enumerators necessarily, but it might, I mean, it's good for them too, but for yeah. organizers. Was there another part to your question politically or that, that, was, that was it? Yeah, so, um, and maybe, uh, I think Jonathan, you might have something to say about what's happening in Puerto Rico, but uh, when we were there um, with Marta and team, uh, with our youth group, we learned that in 2010, in the town of Loisa, that is the Afro-Caribbean corridor, 10% of those living in Loisa identified uh, as being of being black, period. And actually, I think that may have extended to the island. 10% of people living on the island, I would say, essentially identified as being black, uh, which opened up a whole conversation about what it means to decolonize our own minds with respect to race. <laughs> um, so I think it's a really interesting point what you're raising. Um, Rob is uh, within the Latinx community, how do we motivate people to not just think about their culture, but also their race? I mean, it, it touches on the ambiguity, as you mentioned, that someone that is, even even the term Hispanic, right? Like Hispanic as adopting the language of Spain, and that excludes lots of populations in Brazil. Let's say, for example, lots of populations um, that don't that view the Spanish language as colonizing because we identify more as indigenous, as opposed to that. And I think that this is the type of conversation that census outreach should have, as opposed to just it being about, which is important, the distribution of resources based on numerical value. But then for 2030, as we see this deconstruction of a mass system um, and what seeds are we sowing in this census so that maybe next year or the next decennial there are more nuanced questions or representations, or this is an opportunity for a, a, a collective conversation around how do we relate um, to not only identity. So I view this as a, from a political question then, why aren't there then um, in the city MWBEs, right? For example, minority women business entrepreneurships that are probably becoming more competitive and being able to get the distribution of census, of census uh, resources that go primarily to people that identify as, right, Latinx, but black, brown, and advocating for those categories um, because I think it's with political organizing you always run up against the problem of mass people mobilization to push the empire yet there are resources there that if we treat the people's needs as holy we want those resources to get to us and to what extent can we engage and take on those resources without being complicit? Which is what I think, right, you're trying to do with, with Next Day, is that we're gonna have this conversation, we know the complexities of these conversations, and we're gonna be open about them. And bring this into the forefront, and I wish it was more satisfied, like there was a more satisfactory answer that that I could give and I think that the fact that there isn't a satisfactory answer to how do we deal with these ambiguities is not to just say oh well let's stand by and do nothing because there has been an attack with the citizenship question which by the way the unconstitutional nature of the last days where there was the courts making decisions and if you read the transcripts they would call in like the, the Department of Justice like top lawyers and the lawyers all left the case and then they had lawyers that never worked on census being the ones that were in federal court arguing for this and you look at the transcript it was chaos and literally it was tweets that were triggering tweets that were triggering these constitutional crises um so that's that shows us that how informal medium like social media could evolve across Let's say, when did The Apprentice come out? 2000, and when did Trump started tweeting? 
right? Yeah. Like in 10 years, we saw how an informal tool becomes a tool co-opted by empire to drastically attack a certain population. So if we see into the future and believe in the cyclical nature of an antithesis emerging 10 years from now, maybe the people could apply such a tool and, 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 and it being able to do something. And I don't think that's something that we can know, it's something that we must do. So it's not necessarily about knowing, there's no certainty, there's no destination, it's all about direction. So what direction are we moving towards? And this conversation seems to be trying to move into that right direction. Um, that's a, such a powerful question because the way we designed this video, for example, why we count, it's a storytelling campaign. It is up to us as individuals to say, why do we count? Why does the census matter to each of us? So if you see the intentionality and the design of this, it speaks to our intersectional identities, not just as a race or you know, in terms of our ethnicity. You'll see one slide that says, uh, we count for livable communities. And you will notice that we featured uh, a gay uh, couple and we are advocating for, uh, for Puerto Rican LGBT folks to complete the census so that they create livable communities for themselves. So this is an entry point, and it's really a question for all of us, is like, why do we count? If you were to create this video for Afro-Caribbeans or for Filipinos, it looked completely different. You know, I'm Filipino, American, entrepreneur, immigrant, and we are the largest undocumented group in Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and like, how does this particular story look like in that intersectional sense? So my question to every single person in this room is, why do we count? So, yeah. Um, the, the only way you get counted in the census is through filling out the form. You don't use social security, you don't use draft records, you don't use school records, you don't use um, all the things that in our society that we keep count of, right? Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And why is that? Because of confidentiality? Because if you really yeah. want an accurate count, I would think that it would be better to call Social Security, draft records, school records, um, right. birth records, um, you know, all those kinds of things right. would really give you a count. But you want more than a count, I guess, right? So what I can say about that is the U.S. Census Bureau's mandate is to operate independently from every other federal agency. So because of the mandate under the Constitution, the U.S. Census Bureau exists for the sole purpose of an accurate count of its population. And it is not to share its information, nor are other agencies allowed to share the data that they have. Yeah. They, they sh uh, do they coordinate maybe for es estimation purposes? But legally, there's no sharing of data. Yeah. yeah. There is no sharing of data, at least legally. Yeah, you're right to point out that there are other sources of data that can help us estimate populations. Uh, in the interim of the decennial census, there's what's called the American Con Community Survey, which does also adjust for interim census uh, enumerations. So, but that also is through the US Census Bureau. Uh, and the other thing I'll say is that the census data is also largely used by business uh, for all sorts of purposes, projecting revenue, potential opportunities, segmenting audiences. So, so you know, from mul multiple perspectives, it's the U.S. Census Bureau data only that gets used for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, this question. Oh, yeah. I have a two or three part question. I throw it all at you at once. Okay. We'll try. And the first was I. I might have missed this, but. Uh, if, if in the, the percentage that you said that uh, is missing from the Kings County census, the, the people that didn't respond, if, if you know the racial breakdown of that, and 
I'm, I'm interested in knowing the possible relevance of this issue, of the census issue, to gentrification. And in where I, where I live, there's a, a lot of anxiety among the, especially among the Latinx community about, uh, about that, about the shrinking of their community and, and uh, representation in government. Uh, was there a third part of the question? The third part is, if there is, a, if it is relevant, uh, I, I think that that uh, anti-gentrification uh, organizations, for example, could be involved in this. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to get through all three. <laughs> so for the first question, um, unfortunately, we do not know the breakdown of um, race. Uh, so we don't know, like, by... Um, by race who did not mail back their census questionnaire form. So, sorry. But we can um, look at, you know, that hard to count 2020 website and the map. And so you can see uh, where those um, non-response non rates are highest and you can look at their populations there and sort of surmise um, who we're talking about. So that's the best we can do for now. Um, and all of that also comes from the Census Bureau. Uh, I think the second part of your question about um, how the count will impact gentrification, or um, I'll, I'll give you my response to what I, I think I heard. Um, so I think this will be really this this next um, census count result will be really interesting because it will be the first time since 2010 we'll get to see how communities are changing. So for example, I'm from Harlem. And in 2010, that was the first time our community, um, well, since it was the first time that Harlem had a population where the African American community was less than the majority since 19, I don't know, 30, I think. So it'll give you a, a sense of, um, you know, if, if, there, if there are neighborhoods that are being gentrified, you can see by who. And also, um, you can see where people are moving to, to. So right now, they're sort of, um, in the country, there's a shift of African Americans moving from northern cities into the south. That's happening, people sort of migrating from New York um, to Georgia, Texas, all these places, and Chicago, also the same shift is, we're seeing the same shifts. So I think, um, when it, when it comes to sort of housing and gentrification and all of these issues, it's just another way to demonstrate how important the census data is and how, many, how much we can learn from it um, and how it's used not only for population counts and an apportionment of, of seats in Congress, but sort of what Jorge was talking about for businesses and universities and governments and city planning, where we're, where we're thinking about opening schools, um, how all of these things, it's like, it's literally um, the basis of most of our society. So um, that, that's my response to that part of your question. Um, and then I can't remember the last yeah, one. Advocacy groups, are you working with any advocacy groups on your attention? So most of the groups that receive that are advocacy groups the way they're funded it's, it's it's very interesting especially in the post trump era there's been a lot of money going towards um mobilizing communities on let's say immigration resources so um making sure that uh, there's a lot of activity in state legislatures on let's say driver's license for all something recent we've seen know your rights campaigns um, and a lot of those organizations I've said I've seen haven't really engaged deeply uh, with uh, the census. Um, so I think there is a disconnect between the because it's a lot easier to fund and get funders for a priority that they care about that's going to be relevant in the state legislature um, for the next year or two as opposed to a decennial census. Um, and it is I think part of the issue of a lot of the world in activism, um, where we see that 
the issues that get funded are those that are in a media cycle um, and those that are able to deal with I wouldn't say surface level because a lot of the things that pass like rent reform recently here in New York State or the immigration question, um, they deal with a lot of harms that have been caused. Uh, but is there a structural reconstitution of the way our society works? And that doesn't get funded as much. And the census is that. Uh, so that is the, 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 the challenge. And part of what I think is interesting, at least in the Puerto Rico context briefly, um, is we recently had a revolution. Um, a million people, a third of, and it's a part one of many. So there, there needs to be several. Um, so what does that, how does that impact uh, political consciousness of individuals that are looking now at deep issues what was interesting is that there's three different parties in Puerto Rico and people that were protesting didn't view this as a political party movement. It was really a movement over a corrupt um, crony consultant class by a working like poor class. And it literally is the one versus 99 and we saw that. So now how do we see that consciousness translate to diasporic communities here that have recently left and will they see the and i think that's one of the issues you're trying to address will they view the census as a, a good government restructuring uh process to engage um so i think a lot of things get hyped very much um so how do we bring the hype to the structure and not just to the harm um, that we're trying to stop so I have time for two, two more questions. questions. Okay. I have two questions. Okay. Um, it these are pretty short. Uh, first is uh, are all children counted, uh, including babies? Yes, all and beings. The, and the second um, question is uh, <laughs> how does it does it say biracial, triracial? If my son is mixed, is he counted as black or yeah. is he counted as mixed? Or I really. I appreciate what you raised here, uh, Rob, and I think it's going to get us thinking about how we mobilize communities of people to identify all of their identities, <laughs> if I could use those words together. But yeah, like why not list every racial uh, aspect? You know, I could I could say I am... Latino and or mixed and uh, Puerto Rican and Taino and the the census has opened up. Maybe you can speak more intelligently to the to the way we classify ourselves. Well, I don't know about more intelligently, <laughs> but um, yeah. So you, you can definitely indicate on the census questionnaire um, that you are mixed, and you can say how um, at what, whichever level of detail you would like to. Um, this is all like really complicated because these race categories are also made up. <laughs> but it's like really frustrating, I, I'm, I'm sure, to figure that out. Um, yeah, so you can definitely say that. And we also know this information um, about ourselves from, from the census. So like right now we could, we could go, go in and check out a table of the breakdown of New Yorkers by race. And it could tell, tell us the exact number of people that I, I guess this is just a reflection of, again, how people identify themselves. So there's a bit of decolonizing the mind that goes into this. Um, but it's also about identity and it's really complicated. So we cannot you know, tell someone what they are. It's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. Um, one thing I'll, I'll sort of add that's interesting um, as a researcher is that for the first time, we'll, the census will ask um, about uh, um, sort of ma marital status and uh, it'll ask about LGBTQ um, marriages. So we'll know um, how many same-sex households there are in New York State, well, in the country and, and also in New York. So that's really interesting, I think. One more question. So is it safe to assume that the only data that the Census Bureau will share uh, with other agencies or 
businesses, I think you even mentioned, uh, would be demographic data, right? Nothing personal. In other you words, want, you know. Um, yeah, so it's demographic. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to think of. There, yeah, it's all. So the Census Bureau conducts many surveys, as Jorge was saying. There's also the American Community Survey that um, gives us an idea of more than just demographics, but asks um, more personal questions about income. And uh, so we know we can say things about the economic status of the population by race, gender, age. Um, so there's that, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that, if that question is asked on this, on this form. So I can follow up with you, though. Very quick question. Census data does eventually become public. Do you know what the whole back period is? No, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure, but it's really, it's really fast. Because there, there are one-year estimates that come out every single year, so it's a smaller sample size. Um, and they ask similar questions again. So we sort of have, we can take a pulse, but it's not as like, um, it's not as comprehensive as the 10 year decennial census where everyone's counted all at once. But I'm pretty sure it would come out either, that's another one I'll follow up on so I can give you a date. 1940 is publicly available, you can read it. I don't know if anything after that is. No, not yet because People born in 1950, it's for personal, for privacy reasons, census records at a household level are not released beyond 1940 yet, I think. Yeah, right. And so? <laughs> no, I'm saying I, I don't know if that's the criteria, if there's just a, a general pullback period. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, sort of, I guess I misunderstood. You're talking about holdback period on the release of census records oh, okay. at a household okay. level. Sorry, I thought you meant the, the actual data. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, seven years. Seven, 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 zero. seven zero. Okay. Census. Got it. So in 2022, the 1950 census data at a will household become, level will become available. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> because I worked with the census as a team three oh. times. Okay. And the answering the questions that you guys were filling up, one question I was going to ask is, I remember when we were sent on the field, they would tell us regarding demographic, if somebody fill up this and this race, mm -hmm. but you saw that they were blah, 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 we had a little machinery thing where we recorded everything that the household filled on paper and we would put it on the machine. And we were told that we were to put the race that we saw wow. when we visited the house. So. Wow. <laughs> That's one. Yeah. That's so important. <laughs> It wasn't until 1950 or 60 that people were even self-reported. So prior to that time, everyone, it was, it was observer, obser it was observation. But we know that it still happens. As, you know, that this type of bias, and that's kind of also critical, is even within each, you know, immigrant group, dealing with the anti-black bias. The, you know, the kind of the con consistent refusal of not wanting to associate with one group. Yeah. Uh, that uh, is, 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 is shared across every immigrant group and certainly, of course, white people too, but um, that, that's, and so that's gonna be so critical to how the population also makes us, we should be a little skeptical. I mean, the knowing of that can absolutely change the way we're shaping what we do, also for the call for enumerators, right? I mean, how much more important is it for us to have our communities be the ones that are doing what you've done for us, so thank you for your work. <laughs> okay, so, um, Shamir, Jonathan, thank you so much for your respective voices.
Um, thank you to Middle Church, uh, to Christina, to Marta for pitching in for the whole AV team, uh, and to Amanda who really was excited to have this be on the Social Justice Committee agenda. Uh, look out for more updates through the Social Justice Committee on how we are mobilizing as well as the rollout of uh, why we count Powered by Next Day Better. And thanks to Ryan for joining us today and, and sharing the preview of the Puerto Rican video. So.